about 50 miles away from Dulce, New Mexico, as the crow flies, is the largest and highest valley in North America. Called the San Luis Valley, it sits at over 8,000 feet above sea level. The valley has been known for a long time to be a place where many strange events occur. It has been rumored that there are portals to other dimensions in the valley. What's going on in this mysterious valley? The San Luis Valley is in south central Colorado and it actually, ge geologically, it extends down to Taos, New Mexico. So it does actually go below the Colorado-New Mexico border. However, the Colorado portion is known as the San Luis Valley. The lower portion is not, even though it is part of the same valley system. When I say window area, I mean a place that seems to have a preponderance of paranormal activity, be it UFOs, Bigfoot, poltergeist activity, whatever. And often, um, strangely enough, and a lot of people probably watching know this, all those things at once. We describe it as the playground of the paranormal because not only are the deposits just enormously vast there, but you have daily, non-stop paranormal activity occurring. There's a lot that's unusual there, and the geophysical properties, I think, is one of the, the most important things to look at. It's one of the few areas where you'll have large pockets of magnetic energy, maximum field strength and minimum field strength, right next to one another. And when you have that, that close proximity of minimum and maximum field strength, it sets up vortices of, of electromagnetic energy. And where you have the minimum uh, intensity areas, you also have intermittent layers of clay, sand, and water and that creates a perfect natural battery. So you have a variety of uh, gravitic lows, the close proximity of, uh, of field strength. Portals are actually different areas. They're also described as vortexes. Most of the portals that we, we've gone to examine um, are all in places that the indigenous people hold sacred. There's always an oral history in those indigenous tribes of strange happenings going on. We believe that what's causing the portals, which are a tear in the electric membrane that separates dimensions, are vast quartz crystal deposits underneath the topography. That these deposits actually generate electromagnetic fields so strong that they can cause a momentary rip or tear in that membrane. And when you get that tear occurring, you have a momentary interaction between dimensions, and we describe that as being paranormal. And that's just the, the, the tip of the iceberg on some of the things that go on there. As a, as a result of the location, it's the only area in, in North America where three regional groups of Indians overlapped. The Great Plains Indians would go there during the summer, uh, the Great Basin Indians, the, the nomadic Ute, uh, for instance, in, in the Kiowa and the Comanche, and there's 13 different tribes ended up using the valley. And the Southwestern Indians, of course, the Navajo, the Diné people, the Apache, and even the, the Hopi would, would make vision quests up there. So it's the only spot in America that we can say that three regional groups overlap. It's so isolated, you have to understand, it's the world's largest alpine valley. It's completely surrounded and ringed by mountains. It's roughly football shaped. You have the Sangre de Cristo, the longest continuous mountain range in North America, going up the uh, east side, which is also the, the largest volcanic thrust fault in the interior of the United States. It goes from the Gulf of Mexico to Leadville, and it falls, the Sangres are the middle portion of it. And then of course the San Juan Mountains are on the west side, and it's completely surrounded by mountains. And interestingly enough, it's radar invisible below 18,000 feet. There's no monitoring of the airspace below that particular altitude. I mean, pretty much any type of paranormal phenomenon that you, that you can stick your finger on has occurred there, including crop circles in the early 70s. It's the most sacred. In fact, there's four different indigenous tribes that describe the San Luis Valley as being their Garden of Eden. The holiest mountain there being Mount Blanca, which is a 14,000 foot mountain peak, which some of the Indians claim actually have crystal skulls uh, buried on, which is fascinating. But it was in that valley where they describe what's called the Sipapu, or the place of emergence. This was a hole in the ground that they literally crawled up into this existence. and. Uh, while they were down there, they claimed the ant people were taking care of them. It's interesting, the San Luis Valley, which is where Creston is, for about 20 years we've done CE5 expeditions there. And dating back, certainly the Native American times, and old ranchers from the 18, early 19, they reported seeing unusual phenomena and objects that come up out of the earth and go into space and all kinds of things. 
Now, when I first started going there in 93, uh, 24 years ago, we immediately had amazing contact experiences. And I also noticed that there was a, a magnetic field anomaly there where the, the delta, the change in magnetic field is very dramatic in that area. And that seems to have some effect on facilitating or at least having expressed that we're seeing it with the naked eye, extraterrestrial phenomenon. And so there's also the third largest aquifer in North America there underneath this valley. And there is a great deal of evidence that there is an ancient ET presence within the aquifer. And they're transdimensional ETs, they can come in and out. And we have an amazing photograph of one coming out right in front of us and shooting straight up and stopping. This is an amazing photograph. Wherever you find the largest quartz crystal deposits, let's take for example Sedona, Arizona, the mountain range is there, and you study aeroelectromagnetic mapping of the topography, what you find is that the mountains themselves literally exhibit electromagnetic fields that are up to 500 times more powerful than the surrounding countryside. And that's what it takes to cause a rip in that membrane and get that interdimensional activity to occur. One of the places where that occurs almost on a daily basis is the San Luis Valley. Because of the conditions that you find there, you'll occasionally see a piezoelectric discharges from the sangres. The sangres are filled with negative uh, spaces where quartz obviously has grown. And there's some rumors even that Nikola Tesla came there at one point to investigate the discharging of the piezoelectric energy. I have actually seen it on a couple of occasions, late at night, super cold winter nights, with a very low single digit humidity. And you'll see these flashes of, of light that come out of the mountains and go up into the air. And they, they separate from the mountain and go up into the air. And on two occasions, I've seen it. It's really rare, but it does occur. And so what you have is a scenario by which there are areas like this where the fields being generated are so powerful that they're causing this nonstop interaction with another dimension. And the only thing that can explain the wide array of paranormal activity taking place is the fact that these fields exist because they exist in a very small geographic area to one another. Now, today, it's almost like the military slowly buying up these areas where these portals exist, and they're placing a guard at the door of each one. The valley first came into prominence in the 1960s when the first animal mutilations occurred there. All through the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, hundreds of cows and horses were discovered mutilated all through the valley. What was going on with this? So it's interesting. So some of the animal mutilations that started there were counterintelligence operations because what you find is that wherever there's a genuine ET phenomenon, the intelligence community will try to put on top of it their take on it. And there's a National Security Agency guy who used to be the right hand to General Odom, the head of the National Security Agency, that this man analyzed the Marilyn Monroe document for us. And he says, we call it DDT. You set up a, a, a decoy, it becomes a distraction, and then it trashes the whole subject. And he says, we know very well how to run a DDT operation. And so wherever there is this ET phenomenon that's ancient Earth events, you'll find that the intelligence community will often move in with counterintelligence operations and do things that set people off the scent of the real in other words, they spread a lot of fool's gold along, around so you don't find the gold nugget. And I think that's why that started there. The cattle thing is my least favorite uh, thing to investigate. I'm very sensitive to the welfare and, uh, of animals and, and their, the sanctity of, of, of all life. But, but what's happening to these poor, poor animals? Uh, somebody's got to be helping these ranchers, and nobody was helping them. Law enforcement couldn't do anything. You know, there was no scientific organizations that were interested in it. But because of the amount of aerial activity we were experiencing, we had major waves of UFOs from 90, end of 92 all the way to almost 99. So about six, seven year period, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of sightings. You know, Linda Howe and Chuck Sikowski and other investigators 
are very intrigued by the sensational side of this, which only represents 2 to 5% of the data. I think it's, it's going to be quasi-military. I think it's multinational. I think it's more of like along, along the lines of a militarized CDC or NIH, the Centers for Disease Control or the National Institutes of Health. There may be some sort of secret clandestine branch of one of those two organizations or one we don't even know about that's monitoring the environment and they're very very good at what they do there's been a number of cases where veterinary pathologists world-class veterinary pathologists and i don't use that the term lightly john waterhouse actually at iowa state he took a calf that was freshly mutilated and discovered quickly brought it to the forensic lab in the veterinary college and side by side duplicated the cuts that were on the calf he was able to do them all but he said whoever did the ones that got the tongue out he said man this whoever that was was really talented I am a, a world-class surgeon, and he actually even used that. And he said, if somebody could duplicate what I did, these, these are really seasoned professionals doing this. I said, in your viewpoint, could any of this stuff not been done by humans? And he said, no. He said, however, you have to know exactly what you're doing, you have to be able to do it very quickly, and you have to be an expert veterinarian and know anatomy to the point where you can do it in the dark. Dr. Altshuler, who was the only bona fide scientist in the early days who, who looked into this, who was a very good friend of mine, did the original Snippy the Horse case in Colorado back in the 60s, late 60s. He looked into this and he came to the conclusion that they were paramilitary human operations masquerading as alien that were doing this for their psychological warfare value, but also to test out systems and test human response media and human response. Now, interestingly, they were also getting raw materials for some of their underground bases and labs where they were taking certain parts of the animal that had a high mitotic index, meaning that the cells reproduce quickly, like the tongue, the rectum, the sex organs, and what have you, for things they were doing that were hideous experiments in underground facilities. Towering over the San Luis Valley is Mount Blanca. This is the fourth highest mountain in Colorado. The mountain, which frequently is snow covered all year long, is one of the most sacred mountains to the local Native Americans. Right below Mount Blanca is the Sand Dunes National Monument. The Sand Dunes Monument is one of the largest sand dunes in the Americas. Today, there are rumors swirling that there's a base of some kind inside the mountain. Some say it's a military base. Others say it's alien. Either way, Mount Blanca has so many UFO sightings that there's even a UFO watchtower where viewers can come and watch the mountain. Sacred Mountain of the East to the uh, Diné, Hatchie, Navajo. Cisnagini, it's a place where all thought originates. It's where creation occurs. And then uh, it goes around to the north, to Hesperus, to uh, the San Francisco peaks in the west, and then Mount Taylor in the south. Those are the four cardinal mountains of the southwest. Blanca is the stories that I have uncovered from all the way back in the pioneer days to just recently. We've had Bigfoot reports. We've had spectral Indians attacking campers around campfires. The, the old King Ranch, the upper cabin. A guy went by on horseback, but he would have had to have been on a horse 20 feet tall. Now the other thing is that the sacred mountain of the east is Banca Peak. And all the Native American tribes would gather there. We started going there in 93, 94, and we have a contact site up in a remote location where we go into another dimension and ETs appear. And uh, I know for a fact that there is an ancient ET presence inside. This is the I think the uh, second, third, fourth highest peak in Colorado is Blanca Peak. And there's also on the south side of it a man that had some land that where there was a medicine wheel. And we did a CE5 there contact and this object came out of the mountain and it was like liquid blue and it came down and wrapped around us and then a, a rectangular box materialized. A woman almost sat on it. You could do an, a, there's such an amazing series of things just on the Sea SETI experience in the San Luis Valley. And so, you know, for many years we've gone there and I think there's an ancient presence in that area, just like at Mount Shasta. And that the sacred mountain of the east was a gathering place where all the native peoples, they did not fight. 
and the Bloodless Valley was the San Luis Valley for the native peoples. And it was because there was an ancient connection between these interstellar civilizations and early Native American people of that area. And it, it's still that energy, that presence is still there. Although there was an eradication attempt. Now, back some years ago, I had an emergency call from a helicopter line operator who was called in on a mutual assist on the eastern side of Blanca Peak, where there were covert special forces that were attempting to kill ETs inside the mountain using nerve agents or something like that. They had a mishap, and some of their own people were badly injured or killed, and they were calling in mutual assist because he was running a helicopter checking power lines. This man, very credible man, said he went in there. That's what they were doing. And we subsequently had contact when we went there with the ETs who asked that we do what we could to get this attack stopped. So I, I did a thing at the Pentagon where I was trying to get that operation stopped. But yes, that I have tremendous information about that. I was there personally. Well, a helicopter pilot that worked for the utility company was flying checking the power lines, and he was about ready to fly back to the airport, and he got an emergency call from the military from Fort Carson saying, we've had an accident on Blanca Peak. We would need you to go immediately there and evacuate wounded soldiers. And so he's, whoa, you know, this is intense. And the, the reason why they call him, he says, because you know the local weather patterns there. It was the excuse, the, the wind conditions. So he flew over there, and he's hovering over the site, and he sees all these guys, these troops in a wilderness area. What the heck they're doing maneuvers in a wilderness area. It's on the north side of Blanca. And he radioed in and said, what is the nature of this emergency? I forget how they couched it, but it had something to do with the daughters of Saren. Now, what is that? He's saying, what do you mean, Saren? I can't, I'm not going to bring somebody, you know, it's been hit with a nerve agent inside my, my helicopter. Oh, you can just strap them to your skids on your helicopter. And he says, like, no way. You guys are going to have to get your Blackhawks or your Apaches to come get them because I'm not going to do it. So this was one, one of our objectives was to try to stop the sort of outrageous activities, but the deep national security rogue elements within MAGIC, the Majority Intelligence Committee, it used to be called Majestic 12. It's not called that anymore. Um, there are ones that are tremendously rogue, that, that do what they want, that don't answer to any hierarchy. And they will go places where there is an ET presence and try to, quote, eradicate them. Even though they've been there thousands, maybe millions of years, I think at, at Mount Shasta is probably millions. And so this is something of very great concern to us. And, and so we often do expeditions to places like that to have another face of humanity shown that's peaceful. We do this deliberately. We walk right into the belly of the beast. Now some people are kind of appalled when I say, well yes, of course we're going to do this. This is not something for dilettantes. We do this as a very serious peace initiative. I will say that if you go up to Zapata Falls, the parking area, and we remote viewed a location that if you get off the trail off to the right and go up, there's an area before you get to the falls on the right where we found a contact site that's very easy to get to. And you go up there and uh, there are so many amazing experiences we had. Just amazing phenomena. Because remember, interstellar civilizations can be all around us and shifted beyond the speed of light and the visible spectrum and can just pop in. And uh, the entire person or craft will just be there instantaneously. But you need to have the correct kind of cameras and operators in 360 to capture it. And we've never had that. Uh, we do have some amazing images and photographs, but we could have had much more. Where else but Blanca? I mean, all this stuff is centered around this particular mountain. And uh, we've had everything from people reporting white buffaloes at high mountain lakes at almost 12,000 feet. Uh, in 1966, two hunters saw a platypus in one of the high mountain lakes there. Back in 65, 66, into 67, there were reports of these small 10 to 12 foot scout ships that were flying in and out of Blanca and chasing people in the highway, you know, in broad daylight and dive bombing cars going to the great sand dunes. And of course the snippy case happened right at the base of there. And the mountain is overlooking some of the meadows um, that have some of the earliest known 
evidence of humans in North America. When they did a study of the Great Sand Dunes, which is the most mysterious sand dune desert in the world, it's by, by far the highest altitude desert, uh, sand dune desert. It's 700 feet high sand dunes, 49 square miles of sand. The sand does not conform to any of the silica in the valley. It's a completely different color. It has completely different constituent elements. After getting to know the personnel out there, after 10 years, they one, the chief geologist finally told me they don't know how it got there. They, and I said, well, why do you tell people that prevailing westerly winds are blowing sand from the old Rio Grande and piling up in the uh, crook of the mountain? He goes, well, it's got to tell them something. <laughs> but the most mind-blowing thing about the sand dunes is they did a core sample test and they were drilling down in the very center of the dune field and when they got to the bottom of the dunes at the you know, 700 feet down they, they hit wood and there's a covered forest that's covered by the dunes and so you have organic material what can you do you can date it so they carbon 14 dated the wood it's only 11,000 years old so the dunes are only have been there 11,000 years now how do you have a pile of sand 49 square miles 700 feet high that's been piled up in less than 12,000 years. I, I was a geology minor in school. I, I know a little bit about the subject and it is absolutely inconceivable that that amount of sand, even with hurricane force winds every day, could pile up that much sand in such a short period of time. So I had a physicist friend of mine. He called me up all excited one day and he goes, I figured out how the dunes got there. I said, what, what are you talking about? He goes, well, we know the Songrays are filled with quartz. You know, this huge caverns probably filled with quartz under there, right? And he says, well, it's the ant people that supposedly live underneath the ground that take care of the Indians. When the earth's going to cleanse itself, they go through the Sapapu, the place of emergence. One of those entrances is right there by the, by the sand dunes. And they go down there, and the ant people are making more room by carving up the quartz, powdering up and throwing it out the back door. And that's where the glass is coming from. It's the largest pile of pure glass on the planet. It's 98% pure silica. And if you look at any other sand on beaches and stuff, most of it's silica. It's, it's, uh, that's the, the primary constituent element. You can see lightning between dunes. There's supposedly a, a herd of these web-footed horses that have these huge hooves that have been grown out, and, and they're, they're like paddles, and they're able to, to gallop through the sand. The pioneers reported them. Well, there's tons of caverns. Supposedly, there's a, a military satellite system called Dumpster. I forget what the acronym stands for, but I've heard versions that it can map 500 feet into the Earth's bedrock, and I've heard other versions that can go as, as much as a half a mile. Now, I don't know what kind of technology it would take to have that capability. But based on the research that I did, it went operational in the mid-90s, and the first place that they, they mapped was the Giza Plateau. The second place they mapped was the Yucatan Peninsula. And the third place they mapped was the southern Sangre de Cristo Mountains. So it kind of makes me wonder, maybe there's some element of the military, maybe government, Department of Defense somewhere that knows something about what's going on underground in the Rocky Mountains. There's a lot, of, a lot of information that I've uncovered that would suggest that there's a, an ancient antediluvian tunnel system in the southwest. In fact, the ex-postmaster of the Los Alamos lab, his son was my guitar player. And during the summers, he would work as a mail delivery guy underground in the tunnels at Los Alamos on a bicycle. And his grandfather, or the postmaster's father, was an under, underground demolitions expert and he helped expand the lab underground in the late 50s and early 60s. The military uses the San Luis Valley as a social Petri dish. To give you an example, I'm going down Highway 17, you know, pretty late at night, about 10 o'clock at night. I see a row of flashing lights about 300 feet across. Sequence. I immediately stop, get my night vision out. It's three C-130s, cargo planes, wingtip to wingtip and they had sequenced the lights down the leading edge of all three planes wings in perfect synchronization. Now, I was just close enough to hear them. The wind was going the other way. If I had been two or three miles further away, they were really quiet for C-130s, number one. But if I had been any further distance away, I would have seen the mothership flying by. Now, what the heck are they using C-130s, conventional craft, and putting unconventional lighting arrays on there? They're trying to, trying to see who sees it. Do they report it to the sheriff? Is it reported as a UFO? Does that report make it to the local paper? Is, it, is there any spin on that? I've had cases where people are driving along and two 
um, about 30 foot perfect triangles fly right in front of their car followed by F-16s. And they said these were not planes, they were holes in the sky. They were blacker than black. They looked like holes flying by, one right after another with F-16s hauling ass right on their tails. So there's a lot of military activity that goes on there. So it's, I don't know, that place is just, it's so bizarre some of the things that, that were going on. What's really going on in the San Luis Valley may never be fully understood. Because of its geographical isolation, it's a place where it's easy to hide. Possibly both the U.S. military and off-planet forces are occupying areas within the large valley. Like the Bermuda Triangle and other haunted landscapes, the mysterious valley only proves that nature's way is often difficult for we humans to understand.